Hello, everyone. I'm here with Patrick Daly. It's 2.10 a.m. Sunday, February 18th. This is coming at you late night. Coming at you late night style. Coming at you late night theme. Coming at you late night people. Patrick Daly. Real ass homies call him Pat. Fake ass homies call him Daly. How we doing, Daly? I'm doing pretty good, boss. I'm uh, I'm just chilling with my brother right now. Oh damn, who's that? Can uh, you introduce him? Yeah, man. His name's uh Richard Locus. You may know him as the host of NoGradient.com. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I know him. I actually built that guy. Yeah, I mean you are that guy, so. Right, like I said. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. I know it was actually hard to get kind of in touch with you with you, which is surprising, just given that. We were on the team for four years together at PC, and, you know, we've just kind of been friends after, and I'm, you know, staying at your place, so it's weird that it was just hard to get in touch with you, even though I was literally at your place. So I w- really appreciate you coming on the show finally, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah, um, it's been tough to reserve some time with you. You know, you've had a lot of a lot of people to see since you've been here. Easy, brother. Let's... Like I said. And... It's good to see you, like I said. All right. Well, while we're on the subject, right. um, I don't know, something I was just thinking about when we were getting ready, because one of our boys, uh, for those of you out there, one of our boys called, and uh, he wanted to come kick it in post game, and I was just like, no, nah, no, nah, tell him not to come, because like... I know, it was the softest thing. Cause, cause, well, cause we're, sorry, we were, it was the softest thing of all time. No, dude, dude. We, we were going to record the podcast, which we are, Right. All right? and we were going to chill, we were going to riff on a lot of different things and having like a a third person for that would have just killed the vibe. But also like, you know, those times where here's, here's what I, here's what I thought in that moment when that happened is there are some people that you can be so close with that even when you don't want to see anybody, like they're the people you kick it with. Like when I'm just chilling with my roommate, Tim or Nadav, right? Right. When when I'm just chilling with one of them at home, I'm not like, Oh, I'm with people right now. Right. Like that's still totally right. And there's, so there's a level of closeness and a level of brotherhood where you get to the point where you're just like, yeah, I'm chilling with this guy and that's just what I do. Absolutely. And yeah, it's chill. It's a chill realization that there are some people that like, even when you're just like, no, I'm just going to stay in tonight or I don't really want to see anyone tonight, whatever. They're still the people that you're just with. Right. That you're comfortable being with in those times. Absolutely. Yeah. How many of those people would would you have? Uh, would you say you have in your life? <laughs> um, not many, man. I don't think you should have many. I don't think it's something that you're supposed to have a lot of. But I'd say I have like at least three. Right. Four or five, maybe. Totally. I totally, I totally dig that. I think that's, I think that's extremely special. Which is um, which is why, like I said, it's good to good that you fit me into the schedule is all. Yeah. Given you haven't wanted wanted to see anyone the past two weeks. Well, I've I've wanted to see you, brother. Yeah. Like I said, brother. Nah, nah, it's chill. So, obviously, you were an English econ major in college. Um, English, brother. How's this? You wanted to be an English major. No, no, I didn't. You were in that short story class. Oh, that was a chill class. Like I said, brother, you never said that about any of your econ classes. Yeah, I did. I always thought game theory was chill. (laughs) I always thought game theory was chill. This is how you have to defend yourself in 2018. (laughs) By being a total fucking nerd. It's so sad. Dude, game theory is chill. Dude, 10 years ago, dude, it was... (sighs) I guess it wasn't that different 10 years ago. 15, 20 years ago, it was, you know, maybe sports matter more. Maybe. Like, dude, what do you mean? I benched 300. What do you mean I like game theory? What's game theory? Game theory is for nerds. That's true. Oh, wait. Now being a nerd is in. The older you get, the cooler it is to be a nerd. (sighs) Okay, so is it an age thing? Or is it that we are... Is it our age that you know we're transitioning, or is society transitioning as a whole? I think it's the latter. No, I don't think it's society as a whole. I think it's a 
a generational thing or just like a a, a social so all 24 year olds go through what we're going through i think that the vast majority of people who grew up watching movies where like the smart kids were nerds right like just like the way it's popularized in pop pop, pop culture you got like jocks and nerds and the nerds are just like little dweebs who like the nerds are dweebs the nerds are just little like Little nuggets who the jocks toss in lockers. What the? So that's like kind of the way pop culture portrays it. So you're like, I'm not a nerd. I'm not a fucking nerd. And I then, want a hot dog and a hamburger. No, I want a cheeseburger. You'll get nothing and like it. Anyway, uh, for those of you that don't know, that's a Caddyshack reference. Richard's been talking about it all night. Okay, let's not beat him over the head with it. We can do subtle things on No Grady and Brother Beast. All right. Anyway, um, where were we just now? Before I got sidetracked by you. I think that's that's fair. Oh, you know what? I don't know. All right. You know what would be cool is if we go back, just rewind that and just see what we were and then just come back to it. That's actually cool. Okay, take, we're going to do that. Second. And we're back. Daily, just remember what we were riffing on. Yeah, we were uh, actually talking about how it's chill to be a nerd as you get older because you get to a point where you realize that uh, being a nerd is actually more fun. It gives you more options in life. It's a lot cooler than just being a one-dimensional jock. So you start to embrace the fact that you're a nerd. I need to ask how much lunch money was stolen from you personally Brother. in high school. Uh, actually none, but there was one time, um, freshman year, I, I sat down at a lunch table. Uh, I had just gotten this, uh, you're, you're going to shit on me for this, but whatever. I just got, was this pre or post beard? Uh, I had, yeah. Uh, during beard, I had the beard freshman year, 14. You had a beard when you were 14. Yeah. The upperclassmen always tried to get me to grow it out, but I didn't want to be the 14 year old with a, a, a man's beard. So I just shaved it. Dude, but anyway, that's beside the point. I uh, sit down at this table with like a, a soft serve ice cream cone. Soft. It was soft. Um, and this kid's like, yo, you got to get up, dude. Higgins is sitting there. And that was just a kid in my high school. And I was like, all right, I mean, he's not here now. Like, I, he, I'll get up when he gets back. I think he's probably like taking a piss or something. Right. And the kid's like, no, you'll get up now. And he starts like pushing me and what he knocks the ice cream out of my hand. So I just get up and I socked him in the su- in the stomach. What the... And we both got uh, taken to the principal's office. It was pretty funny. Um, but he actually got in more trouble than I did. And he was all pissed off. He was like, he punched me. And they were like, yeah, well, you like instigated him. You bullied him. And they also the kid was, I mean, the kid had kind of a reputation. Whereas I was like, I did not. You socked him in the stomach? Socked him. Just knocked the wind right out of him. Absolutely wrecked him. You have a history of violence, don't you? <laughs> I don't. I don't. Yeah, but you don't. Damn. That's insane. Okay, so you were then, got it. So you were the bully. Uh, no, in that case, I, that was the, probably the closest I got to being bullied. Um, and it was also the closest you've been to bullying. I guess, yeah. But congratulations. I would call that defending myself, not no, bullying. No, no. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <sighs> That's unbelievable. Talk to me about. Talk to me about what the what the average person does not understand about security. Oof. Okay. Um, What's the biggest misconception? Uh, I think that from a consumer perspective, right, just as a regular person, not in your, in your work environment, right, but outside of work at home, there's this misconception that because you're not a high profile person, you're not a target for a cyber attack. Right. Like who wants to hack my account? Nobody. Yeah. Oh, who's, who's listening in on what my network's doing? Who's st- like logging my keystrokes to see if I, to see what my uh, username and I've password got, is got $20 for my bank in account. My account. That's all I have in my name. Who cares about me? Right. 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 Exactly. But that's not how these work in a lot of cases they're not just targeted attacks right um you know it's an email that gets sent out to thousands of email addresses it's uh 
it's an automated program that's pinging the internet for a specific IP address, or sorry, not a specific IP address, um, a specific software version or a specific type of device that has a known vulnerability. And then automatically, once those uh, devices that it knows are vulnerable are found, just automatically hacking them, exploiting the vulnerability. Right. So it's, people think of it like someone's going fishing with a fishing rod and they're not going to, they're not going after them. They're going after the, the big tuna. Right. But it's more like you're just tossing a net in the water and whatever comes up, comes up. Right. Damn. I think that's, I think that's a great point because I've heard people, you know, just basic things like not using a password manager, not having unique passwords on different websites, not using two factor authentication. So not only does someone need your password, they also need a second factor, so called two factor, which is your phone, maybe a little USB key, little, not USB key, just a regular key with a changing passcode. There's a second factor. And these basic things I think people, people ignore. Right. No, I agree. I mean, yeah, cybersecurity is just a fascinating field. Um, we were kind of riffing on this before, but like we are just not ready right now from a security standpoint for where the future is taking us. Where do we stand with security right now and where is the future taking us? Well, the future is taking us to just complete interconnectedness. Everything you have is going to be a connected device. Right. We're not going to call it IoT in 20 years. It's just going to be things. There, right. there are probably going to be things that don't end up getting connected, but the vast majority of things, anything that you could gain value, any potential value from the data, um, anything that could benefit from automation, such as uh, my roommate Tim, he's got an Alexa. And he's got the Philips Hue light bulbs. Right. When he's coming home, those light bulbs, the, the Alexa knows that he's coming home because it's connected to his GPS on his phone. And those lights come on when he gets close and they shut off when he leaves. So everything's just like, like you wouldn't think, why, why, do, why do I need connected light bulbs? Well, you don't need it, but... It's just one less thing you have to do. It's just easier. So eventually it's just going to be the only type of light bulb there is. Right. And so we're moving towards this complete interconnectedness. And a lot of these IoT devices that we're talking about here are being built with really low cost processors that uh, can't support any type of software at all, any type of agent on the device and still work. You're not going to put antivirus on a light bulb. Right. Um, and we don't yet have out just outside of IOT and security in general. Um, there aren't enough people working in security. Now I need to say something quickly okay. before I forget this. Do you think you mentioned, you mentioned everything's going to be connected. There's not going to be any, a light bulb. Of course it's connected. The, the case you'd have to point out is when it's a not connected. So we're going to start saying maybe an unconnected light bulb. I don't know, but I, uh, I, I, I take your point. But don't we think that there's still going to be pockets like cabins, for example, or kind of retreat centers or, or just uh, little, little, little pockets um, where, oh, absolutely, this connectivity won't exist in those places. We're not sure. Going. Sure. But, um, uh, but I think for the the average person, the vast majority of people who just live right. kind of the the way that we do in America, just like maybe living in a city, living in a suburb, wherever you live, if you're just kind of connected to the grid already, you're just going to become more connected. Sure, there will be there will be people and things that stay unconnected, but if you are currently connected, you're not going to get any less connected as time goes on. Right. I I wonder though as we start to really because you know internet we're talking where it's really taken off we're talking the past two decades that's not that long um, we're still feeling this out you know we were f we were feeling cigarettes out for Fukin 
call it centuries before we realized what they were doing to us. I wonder I wonder if there is going to be somewhat I don't think so, but I wonder if there's going to be some somewhat of a backlash on the hyper connected uh uh life could be. that we're starting to lead. I mean co- schools in there could Europe be we're already starting and to limit it, screen usage and things yeah, like that. And when it comes it's going to be when there's like a, a catastrophe, a catastrophic incident. So you're saying maybe a very famous person who gets addicted. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. I'm talking about the interconnectedness posing a uh, a risk to health and safety of of citizens. Because if we think about, dude, all this interconnectedness, you know, we talk about smart cities. It's moving into the city. You know, everything's, it's already connected. It's going to get more so. The more things you connect, you, the more things you connect, the greater the attack surface. I mean, if you have physical processes in the city of Boston right. being basically run by insanely old, in some cases, proprietary operating systems, right. or maybe maybe it's not in proprietary, but we're talking like old versions. Yeah, old versions of sure. Windows, really old versions. Sure. Um, so when that shit's being run by that type of software for those are the those are the workstations that can you know control the inputs and everything um that makes it pretty easy to get in so if you think like right. like you see those scenes in the movies where someone's just like hacked the the uh the street lights and they're turning every light green i am the real napster that's that's like far fetched and it's an extreme example but that's kind of what a fear is like that is a le- that is a legitimate fear with the complete interconnectedness of right. of cities and public systems. Right. So, right, interesting. So you're saying water treatment plants, manufacturing, and utilities. I was. It was it's interesting because I was pointing out the effects directly on humans, and meaning, oh, this Bob uses his phone all the time, and he really just can't be in the moment. He can't. You know, he ha- has a very short attention span now. He can't read like he used to. He's very, very superficial in in what he and what uh, in how he consumes things. Um, versus what you were saying was our whole infrastructure, our whole world, everything's getting connected, and that poses uh, poses a serious, a serious uh, vulnerability, a serious risk. So, the interconnectedness of the human, you're saying, is kind of lines up with the interconnectedness of all the things that, all the tools we use around us, and it's going to be a... Yeah, for sure. I, yeah, I think that's, I think there's going to be some serious growing pains. Yeah, and I think that... Um, back to what we were talking about with the the problems in security. There's not enough people working in the industry. Um, something like a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand unfilled jobs in the security industry. It could be more than that. I don't know. Um, there's not enough people. The detection isn't good enough yet. We're very good. The security industry is very good at identifying things it already knows about. If there's a malware signature, and it's just a you know, if there's a signature for heart bleed and your Norton antivirus will stop anything with that type of that signature. Right. Right. Sure. That's easy. We already know about it, but new attacks that come out, um, that you can't rely on a signature that you have to rely on behavior, traffic patterns, network right. and, and, and you know, analysis of traffic, um, analysis of device and user behavior. Those things just pop up false positives all the time. And then the security analysts who are getting those alerts have to go through them. And it takes takes a little while to investigate each alert, and then it turns out to be nothing. Right. And so you're talking tens of thousands of alerts a day that you know a, a security operations center might have to deal with, and they don't have enough people to, to handle all of that. Right. My, my big one... And I'm sorry, also, they don't have enough... They don't have the tools to properly handle it. So lack of people, lack of really relevant tools these days. There are a lot of companies now that are moving towards rather than saying like we can 
even we can help you detect or we can help you prevent. There are some mm-hmm. companies that are just providing the tools to hunt threats more quickly in an automated fashion. Right. Squirrel, IBM has a product. Um, yeah, I mean, Squirrel's really the big one. They were actually just bought by Amazon, which is very interesting. I, I always wonder, we've riffed a little bit on this. A, a lot of these things are, a lot of things in security, I, and I think this is another misconception of the public, a lot of problems are virtually, basically solved. Things like certifying that something came from a specific from a specific server. Yep. That when I serve up Google.com, I have a certificate with a public key that verifies that I am the correct person who's serving that up. Um, and you know things like encrypted. Just encrypted communication, SSL, HTTPS. Um, when you're con- when I'm connected to a bank, no one's looking at no one. No one can read that data, um, uh, at least if it's implemented properly. So I guess there's a lot of off-the-shelf things. There's a lot of problems that have been solved, and it still, even given that, like for you know, take encryption for example, if implemented properly. No one's no one's cracking that. There's no 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 one's cracking it. I, sure, you can get around around the encryption, but you're not gonna you're not really cracking the encryption directly. No, you're not. So, I think people don't realize that. Okay, yes, security is security is is tough, but there are we there has been huge, still huge huge advances, um, in. Uh, in security, I mean, dude, look at look at iOS and Android alone. iOS has a bit of a uh, better track record uh, than Android with this, but Google's doing a lot better with monthly security patches, um, which not all manufacturers uh, implement, but the Pixel devices certainly do, and uh, Google's really stepping up their game there. But Android and iOS compared to Windows, and even mac os it's we we we've we've come we've come a long way um uh there's uh, viruses just aren't i think nearly as yeah on on a consumer level well windows windows gets a bad rap right because it is the most widely used operating system in the enterprise and because of that it's the operating system used on much higher value targets and when you are developing malware or when you're de- when you're getting ready to prep an attack a lot of it is operating system specific oh totally so you're not um you know you're looking for vulnerabilities in windows software because you know that's what bank of america is running right you're not looking for vulnerabilities in ios because you don't care about somebody's iphone as much you're not going to get as much valuable information off of it right now you might you know that that sounds like it kind of goes against what we were saying earlier with like oh i'm not a high value target not true it's it still is the same it's just that your windows devices are the ones that would get scooped up and i'm not saying there aren't there isn't malware out there probably developed for ios or android totally it's there just is. it's just less common because the operating systems aren't used in as critical of environments. Sure, that's part of it. They're also a lot more locked down. They're they're a lot less flexible. There's programs can't just do arbitrary things in the background. Android's gotten a lot better at this since I believe Android uh, Marshmallow they started implementing some of this stuff. iOS has basically done it from the beginning. Um, but so I think that is yes, that is part of it. And also, well, actually, to counter that, what's the most popular? Uh, operating system on the planet right now, Android. Uh, period. There's a lot more Android phones out there than uh, Windows devices. Um, but granted, these critical systems, like you said, eh, they're not running on. They're not running on Android phones. 
critical systems are running on people's uh, PCs, Windows, and that's really the, um, I think that's the higher value target. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Perfect. I knew you would, brother. <laughs> yeah, well, I said it first. That's why. What the? Yeah, that's true. Um, I was just agreeing with you. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly I think the uh, the Snowden revelations really kind of woke everyone up, regardless of, of what you think uh, politically, whether he, sh- he should or should not have done that. I personally think he did the right thing. Uh, um, House Intelligence Committee got lied to at least once. Uh, General James Clapper lied about not doing bulk data collection. Um, I think I think the U.S. government should a little uh, should have been more forthright. So at least we could have voted on it and uh, acknowledged that okay, we are going to allow this, but at least let's let's have our say rather than just do it in secret, lie about it, and then we have to have someone leak documents to. Uh, to find out the truth. Uh, but with these revelations, security is has become top of mind now for Google, Amazon, Microsoft. Microsoft had special plans of you could keep data, and you can do this with Amazon and, uh, and uh, Google, I'm sure, but Microsoft said you can prevent your data from ever entering uh, the U.S., Rather, it will enter the U.S., but it won't be stored there. Uh, so you can choose after this, after these Snowden revelations, I'm, we'll say this was a result. You could choose plans to say, oh, I'm going to park my data in Germany. Right. Which, it's, look at Apple and the FBI coming to blows. It's crazy. These private, big, big-ass corporations. Yeah. Well, dude, so we we've been kind of riffing on security right now and we're talking about how, how chill it is and how great it is. And I mentioned some problems before, right? but, um, another big problem is right now the attitude towards cybersecurity. It's something that actually, I think a lot of people, like a lot of individuals are getting more, more woke to almost, you know, they're getting, they're, they're starting to, I don't know. I I feel like thinking about cybersecurity and thinking about like the security of your information online woke to is more, more people are con- are thinking right. about that. More people are worried about it today because it's more of a threat. Right. But as we look at businesses that are holding our information, right? Because there's nothing we can do about that. I'm going to buy things online, whether it's from Amazon, who who does a good job with this, or maybe an, maybe another company like Target that we saw with that breach. Um, came in through the HVAC system. Came in through the HVAC system. What year is it? Lowest hanging fruit. Just go for what works. Weakest link. The weakest link in the chain. But my point is that at a lot of companies, security isn't necessarily seen as a an imperative. It's seen as a cost center. You do what you have to do. You spend the amount of money you have to spend on the products you need to buy to meet your compliance and regulatory requirements. And then the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, or in some cases just Chief Security Officer, is the guy who takes the fall when the breach happens. Dude, breaches are going to happen. No matter what, information is going to get stolen. The question is, how do you respond to it? Today, because these companies don't have enough tools or proper tools in place in a lot of cases, um, and detection in general, like we've talked about, is difficult. It takes about four months. It might be down now to about three months, closer to three for an enterprise to identify that a breach has occurred on average. Why does it take so long? Because there's so much shit going on. You know, we talked about the alerts. It's hard to identify these things if you don't if you don't already know about it, if you don't already have a, a signature for something. Right. Oh, so they'll 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 back back test. They'll be they'll with be with those signatures they'll back test the traffic and see what happened? Uh, no, 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 but I'm saying, I mean, yes, that's also possible. They could say, oh shit, we've had this, this was in our environment for the last six months. Right. Yeah. 
Right. And we talk about how far we've come in security, but then we have issues like Meltdown and Spectre that just pop up. You know, I don't think they'll turn out to be as big of a problem as was initially believed. Really? There haven't been any known Meltdown or Spectre related attacks. A lot of the operating systems and the vendors uh, have issued patches that kind of address it. Um, but it's a, it's kind of a crazy thing that it wasn't realized before that no one had found this before because it's a process. It's a practice that's been in place in computing for a long time. Right. You know, the, the pre-caching, right. pre-caching code into memory, predicting it. Right. Predicting what's going to, predicting what's going to, uh, possible executions that need to take place doing it ahead of time and as a result of doing those things ahead of time you mess uh, you mess with the memory you put you put stuff in registers it's kind of the lowest one of the lower levels at least for storing things you put it in the registers muck around with it it gets to the point where you need to decide was this execution worth it right and so it but it turns out that the process that was being done to do that yep. was exposing everything in memory so this was discovered by researchers, but it could have been, and we don't know if it was or not, but it could have easily been discovered by an, by a nation state or a criminal organization totally. years ago. Totally. What do you think of uh, the industry's uh, response, those involved, Intel, AMD, uh, ARM Holdings? Um, what do I think of what their responses yes. were? To be honest, I think they could have done a little bit of a better job with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure they could. I don't really know how I feel about it. I didn't pay t- pay too much attention to their responses um, in terms of like public statements. Right. Intel. Well, so Spectre affected. Spectre was in Intel and AMD. No, Spectre was everyone, I'm pretty sure. Okay. And Meltdown was Intel and Meltdown AMD? Was Meltdown was certainly Intel, and I think it might have applied to others, but it was mainly Intel that took the f- t- the fall on, th- on Meltdown. They got the most uh, flack for that one. Yeah. And their response was um, they they essentially downplayed it. They tried to downplay. Right, because they they tried to say like, look, this would actually be pretty pretty tough to do. Right. There is there is some. Yeah, I don't want to give them I don't want to give them too much credit, but there is some truth to that. That if right. you if the best people in the world are working on this and they just discovered it, what are the odds that a it was already known about by someone? It's possible. It's it's not might might not be likely. Might be likely. I don't know, but it's definitely possible that it was not known about before. And then also, given that it was known, what would the difficulty be in executing it? I wonder. And how many people would be able to do that? How many organizations would be able to do that? So yeah, it's a it's a okay response. Like yeah, you know, you're probably safe for now, but just do get a patch. Right. But also, I I agree with you. They could have done more to explain to the people kind of what was going on, right. what they were doing to fix it. It it, it just blows my mind. The, the biggest the biggest indicator, rather, the biggest. The thing that has the biggest effect on our personal lives is increasingly seems to be increasingly not governments but big companies. So I think 50 years ago even the U.S. government had a little more control over over you uh, as an individual or rather your safety was a lot more in their control. For example, police force we're all familiar with that, w- what that does. But now, nowadays, the police force isn't protecting your bank account information. Now, they are, you know, certainly. FBI. Inve- you're right, you're things. right. But my point is, who's who's protecting that, really? At the end of the day, Bank of America. You're Google, right. Google, Amazon. But who? The government. Who yeah. is protecting them? Who protects Bank of America? The FDIC. Monitor, like if 
if shit gets stolen, sure. the FDIC, the, your United States government steps in. And I think that also what you're saying that well, it's not th- stolen. It's if the bank is insolvent, right? Uh, also possible, but your, your money is insured. Right. So regardless of the source of loss, right. Your money's insured. Um, which is why you feel comfortable putting your money with that bank, which then the banks spread money out throughout the, the lending process. So the U.S. government, just by doing that, just by ins- having an, that that safety net in place, right, almost just enables the the capital markets to flow. Sure. And I, but I, I want to get back to this other point that I, before you before you say what you're about to say, that I think mm-hmm. that what you said about the our lives being more dominated by companies now than in the sure. past, whereas it was the U.S. government, I think we think that. But if you think back to like the 1950s, dude, like, okay. like Philip Morris, the tobacco companies, um, you know, just like their hold on people, the the big like department store brands, like their holds on people, like it's different, um, and we're definitely more, I don't know, attached to our things because we've now had them for a while. So we do have a we have a more ingrained reliance, but I think that private private and public companies were uh, shaping American lives more than the government for a very long time. Henry Ford. Oh, absolutely. Standard Oil. Absolutely, of course. Standard Oil got broken up, but the I'm saying. Yes, certainly private companies had a huge effect in the 50s. I'm saying they have a bigger effect now. That may be right. But I don't know. I don't know is the is the change that Amazon brings now with cloud computing or that Apple brings with the iPhone sure. a larger or smaller marginal change. So think no iPhone to iPhone versus no car to car versus no plane to plane. You know, what is really the the larger marginal change in a person's lifestyle based on that invention? And I'd argue it's the car or the train or the airplane, you know, ways of moving around. I'd argue it's the the television, a, a completely new way of distributing content that then we... We rely on it today, and it's been innovated. It's been enhanced, pushed forward. Right. But at its core, it's watching something on TV versus listening to it on the radio. So I think that the advancements of private companies have always had a hold, and I think that the you could argue at any point that we are changing more rapidly, but that I don't know if that's necessarily the case we're just still moving. We're just moving forward. And I, I don't know that the marginal change in our lifestyle is any different from the change that someone experienced when they grew up in the early 1900s when cars were just being invented. Right. And the horse, the Pony Express, went by the wayside. So did all those agriculture jobs. Used to, from 98% to 2%. Well, that's what happens as an economy develops. You, especially with more uh, technology, we don't need as many farmers producing a greater amount of food than way more farmers could have 200 years ago. Something I've riffed on in my brain is 2% of the population feeds 98% of the population. And they are feeding this 98% of the population... So that eventually someone or some company in this 98% of people invent something to replace their jobs. Or make their jobs easier. Okay. I mean, dude, if you think of the life of a farmer right now versus the life of a farmer 200, 300 years ago, it's probably a lot better 
in terms of the amount of, I mean, farming is still just backbreaking work. But can you imagine farming without like a tractor driving a, a plow with oxen like th- do that shit every day for 40 years you're broken what like that would just destroy your body that would destroy your body the the light i think right. yeah i think that the prospects and the comfort of a farmer today are much greater than back then Yeah. I'm sorry I big timed you though. What the no. You're right. I get that. Um I guess the analogy there is that self driving cars, what, six million people make a living off driving in the United States. Those jobs are gonna go somewhere else. Yeah, and also the trucking industry is dying. Without self-driving cars. Why? Trucking is a, is a horrible job. Like It's a horrible lifestyle. You know, ex- there is extremely, extremely high churn, high turnover in the trucking industry. People go in, they do it, they leave. Right, but is that really diminishing? It, w- there are more people leaving the trucking industry than entering. We, You should know that. You read that on... That was the first Benedict Evans post you ever showed me about autonomous vehicles in an autonomous future. On his blog, he talks about that, how they're, how the trucking industry is already dwindling. It's already very small. And self-driving cars, honestly, dude, because these guys sit at the wheel for like an insanely long amount of time. I don't understand. If you could have a self-driving car and just have a dude sit in it, you that would completely improve their lives. Productivity boost. Yes. How has trucking gone down if the amount of goods shipped? It's not that trucking has gone down. There are just less people, and they work more hours. Right. And there's also, yeah, there's trucking is a major means of shipping, but there's other ways to ship. Right. Now, what makes you, what makes you tick? I saw the, you know, in college... you always knew how to appreciate reading. What the? I remember that about you. Appreciate reading. And you appreciate it post-grad as well. Um, But it was fascinating to me when you got into cybersecurity, for example. This was some econ guy that barely knew how to turn his uh, HP uh, laptop on. That's true. And I'm actually, I'm I'm pretty bad with computers in general. Like, actually, I'm I'm a lot better now, probably partly from this job, but like back in college I was the worst with computers. I remember you you had that HP the the classic one that Oh yeah. All that all the BC students got. Well, yep. if you wanted to get the the special If you wanted to be a sellout. Right. I No, I, it turns out I didn't know anything about computers and that was like a bad deal and a shitty computer. Oh my god. It wasn't even a good deal. Dear god. That computer got you through school. I think Malloy had one of those ones too. Yeah, it did get me through school, but barely. But here's my point. You join this re- you join this research company. You you're studying security, and, uh, and after you know a couple months, we're, we're talking because I'm I'm a I'm a developer, so you're mostly a podcast. Host. Right. So. Uh, um. But yeah, I would say, yeah, okay, Daily, relax, brother. Yeah, I mean, when I just started, welcome I had to... to w- I said, welcome to my industry, dude. It's like, yeah, I used, to, pill. I used to text you asking what a, what a server was, and you just send me what is .com. What the... What is this? You just send me the Google results, cause, and I get it now, because it's a stupid fucking question. You can just Google what a server is. I love that. I ta- Did I teach you how to fish there? Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, I, I, get, I get what you're saying. I didn't know shit when I right. started this job. But then after six months, after a year, I'm like, holy hell, this guy's just learning. And it was a classic case of, you can, l- I think people undervalue the fact that you can learn something. There is, so that that book that I've been telling you to read, Dune, if anyone who hasn't read it, right. um, it's insane. And there's a line in the book where the main character 
is thinking to himself, and I'm going to, I'm going to botch this line. So don't quote me for word for word on this. Absolutely. But he basically says like it in the third person, it's like, it always amazed him how some people found re how some people found learning a thing to be hard, to be difficult because then this, the thought goes on to be like, learning is easy. Anyone can learn. You just have to do it. Right. Like it, People, there were people who say like that's not true learning is hard there's some things yeah whatever it is hard you're right it's hard work it's a lot of time right but if you if you strip that away right it is the easiest thing just right. time time and focus and that's how you learn right yeah i think i think you're i think you're a good learner i've seen you pick things up i just the way your brain works too. You've memorized quotes after hearing uh, hearing it said one time, which is, uh, has always impressed me. Another thing I'm curious about is I can always rely on an arg- on an argument if there's a heated discussion. I can always rely on your opinion to be have some what's the word practical has a practical lens on it. So to be pragmatic, excuse me, is that what you're saying? Pragmatic, but also practical, really both. And I can always count on you in discussions, lively discussions. It's very easy to get polarized. It's no, uh, you know, you should always allow this. You should never allow this. uh, And uh, almost every time I count on you to come in and say, well, it's a little more nuanced than that. Is that on purpose or is that something that you're just hearing for the first time and realizing for the first time? Um, yeah, I, I guess w- w- I think I'm realizing this for the first time. So what do you, what do you mean? Like, give me uh, an example, maybe something, did anything happen tonight or oh, this past? Respect. Recently. A s- specific example. Um, Maybe not a specific one, but like right. a general ballpark type of it, example. It, it, it's just, it's almost like there's so many. I can't think of it. It's almost just in every discussion. It's just, it's just, okay, there's going to be a, a couple hardos on either extreme. And then you're going to be the hardo for the middle. Or you're going to say, well, in this case, but in this case, and like, it's kind of the, I, I like to call, I like to call it the come on approach. Right. No, well, I do think that in a heated discussion, people just tend to, to double down on something they say first. Right. So I think a lot of times people just end up like saying things that they know aren't really true or aren't even what they believe. But like, because they said something before they just end down a path. Like, like I haven't been in a discussion that gets more moderate as it goes on. Like everyone starts out like kind of in agreement and then they find a source of, it's kind of crazy. Like if you, there's a source of disagreement that sparks an argument and that just causes this divergence to either extreme and I think that in a lot of cases I mean nothing in the world is black and white there's going to be gray areas there's going to be everything is situational Um, absolutely and so it's always I always think it's valuable to look at things from from as many angles as possible Um, it's kind of interesting to think about how like someone else would look at something so so how someone else would view a situation versus how you would view it right right absolutely Uh, yeah you got anything else brother you got anything else you want to say i think uh like i said really appreciate sitting down with you um it's funny because we were just going to riff for a little bit because we got back it's kind of late we were just going to riff for a bit just for fun and then maybe just kind of see what the deal is tomorrow and try to put something together. But this was uh, this was fun. This was relaxed. This was cool. I think uh, a decent amount of things came up that, that we riffed on consistently. Uh, and it's good to hear you put that on paper, put that pen to paper, that voice to audio. Yeah, man, it's been uh, it's been good to be here. It's been good to be here, dude. L- and like I said, thank you 
really thanks for just fitting me in. I know that was <laughs> okay. Well, no, I mean your schedule has been tough, and it's no, you're right, you're no, right. It's been I had to get you at two a.m. on a Saturday. That okay. was the only time you had free. You're right. You're right. That's my bad, dude. And you know, and I appreciate you saying that live on this on this show. Um, yeah, it's my bad. You haven't been around. What the, what the ladies, Jesus? Ladies Patrick Daly. Like I said, big ass homies call him Patrick. Real ass homies call him Pat Daly. I actually got that wrong at the beginning, but let me just fix it as I close it out. Thanks for settling that, dude. You've always been a beast, brother. Thanks for coming on the show. Jesus.